When the only constant in life is change, you need to be ready. This is the Man Made Survival Show. Hello everyone, my name is Jose Prado with Memon Survival. Thank you so much for coming back to the channel and watching this video. Today we have a very interesting guest to the show. His name is Wesley. Uh, his website is superstraps.com. And we're going to be talking about a really cool subject today, which is bug out bags. Uh, excuse me, uh, bug out vehicles. And it's, you know, something that the prepper community has always been interested in. It's something that we should all have. And today we're going to take Wesley's perspective on all of this, and he's going to be the one that's going to be showing us what we should be having in our kits that's in our cars. And for people who's just now starting to prepping because, you know, 2020 has been a crazy year, you'll know exactly what to put in it. All right. So I'd like to welcome you, Wesley, to the uh, Man Man Survival Show. Thank you so much for coming. Hey, thanks, Jose, man. It's an honor to be here, buddy. I appreciate it. So, so tell us about yourself. Uh, what, what got you started into the prepping and everything? It, I wouldn't say it's something I've always been into as like a child, um, but kind of going after going into the military and uh, doing a lot of uh, Appalachian trail hikes and everything, the outdoors started being more of a, you know, this is pretty cool sort of thing. Um, and it just slowly adapted um, same way as our business. As I started sharing some different little survival kits that I was doing on a Facebook page, like a decade ago, people was like, Hey, would you make this survival kit for me? It was actually a little bracelet we'd made. Um, so I started having people coming to me asking, Hey, would you make these for us? And that's kind of how our business developed. I had so many people come and it was just easier to have like a, a name of a business and say, go to this website and we'll sell it from there. Um, and from selling the gear and everything, it made me do more research, uh, go to more cat classes and, uh, kind of better myself. So uh, I slowly developed into a prepper based on kind of my life experiences and how the public came to me wanting to make some of these basic kits I was making. Yeah, oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have the uh, a similar experience to where the people that I work with and the people that, you know, I had in my life, they're the ones that came to me asking for, for advice. And that's, that's how I started Memon Survival. So so I guess we had a similar kind of uh, experience on that. So, um, so the, the first question that I have for you here for, for the podcast is, um, can any vehicle be a Volgat vehicle? That, that's a good one because I think a lot of the people that are just coming into the prepper world, they see these bug out vehicles like the Mad Max style, like these decked out four wheelers and bulletproof shields on the side and that's what people picture as a, a bug out vehicle and anything less is just not acceptable but that that's not what it is I mean uh, we talked a little bit beforehand about um, the impression a vehicle makes um, so if you're driving one of these Mad Max vehicles you, you, you could possibly be drawing attention to yourself and making yourself more of a target so I tend to, to rely on the kind of more low pro profile idea where, you know, a, a Subaru, uh, a Honda, a Civic or something, those could also be bug out vehicles. So yeah, any vehicle for the most part could be a bug out vehicle. It's about the mindset you have around it and what you do to prepare that vehicle. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense because um, it, it is possible, right? That you, you have this, really expensive vehicle that that everybody's going to be looking at and the people who know other preppers that know they know that you have stuff on you and they might want to take you out to get your vehicle or whatever it is that you may be transporting the vehicle so you can make you a target and not only that but maybe law enforcement they might also pull you over you know and try to get it from you do you think that law enforcement might want to take it or any other government agency maybe if there's a, a military checkpoint or something like that that might lay you through or they might take it from you? Uh, in the U.S., uh, I don't see government and law enforcement officials really under any scenario wanting to commandeer, um, you know, even constitutionally, there's, there's uh, things on the books about taking over your house for like wartime soldiers staying in your house. It, this stuff's too governed and it would, it's just not likely and in my opinion, not possible the government or law enforcement would ever 
you would ever be a target to them because you do have those preps, those, you had that vehicle that, that sticks out. Um, so that, no, I don't see that scenario. Oh, okay. Yeah. That, that, yeah. Um, yeah. I understand. I see what you're saying. I mean, this is a good thing that we have a constitution. It's a good thing that we have the rule, rule of law, you know, in any scenario. And even if the governors try to do some kind of um, special law or give themselves any type of power that where they, they, can, they can confiscate it, you know, you can fight that off in the court or whatever. But uh, for, for the people who are just starting or even people who have been prepping for a while, but they don't know what to put in their vehicle, you know, it's been something that they don't really pay attention too much to. What, what would you recommend they put on there? Well, I guess before we talk about what to put in it, kind of going back to what vehicle would be best. Um, so when you're choosing your vehicle, you want to look at, I believe it's eight things. It's like, you've got the three M's, the four S's and the I. So there's mileage, you know, how, how good is the, the fuel efficiency? Um, because if it is kind of that SHTF scenario, is gas going to be available? You know, is it going to be you pulling over every couple of hours to siphon fuel? So mileage is number one, uh, mobility is number two. This is things like being is the vehicle four wheel drive, you know, can it forward water, things like that. So you, it's not the end all, none of these in itself, it, it doesn't, I'm not saying it have to have like 50 miles per gallon. I'm not saying you have to have four wheel drive, but when you start choosing a vehicle using these things I'm about to tell you, and you're not meeting any of these, you are probably picking the wrong vehicle. So after mobility is maintenance, you know, how easy is it to maintain that vehicle? If it's some uh, foreign car, BMW, those are very difficult to work on even by basic mechanics. You know, these foreign cars that are imported, um, simple parts to fix them, even a filter can be hard to find. Like, so you want to choose cars that are either made in America, made in Mexico, that are common to this, this general area, where, or wherever it is that you may live. How easy is it to maintain that vehicle in kind of a SHTF scenario? So that's the three M's. The fourth is the speed. And this is just going back to like, you know, do you want to drive a, a, a moped that's got a top speed of 24 miles an hour or something? It, sometimes you may need to get some acceleration and get out of there. Um, but again, like I say, it doesn't have to be a fast car. These are just things to consider. Um, storage, and this is, this is more to your actual question. Um, your vehicle does need to have some sort of storage. So this is where maybe a Honda Civic wouldn't be a good thing. It's got basically just a little trunk, a very small trunk. You can barely fit a suitcase in. Um, your vehicle needs to have a certain amount of preps inside of it, which I'll de detail those after I go through this list. So yeah, storage is a, a very important thing. And to me, it's one of the most important, um, security, you know, do the doors lock, you know, does the glove compartment have its own lock? Um, like you don't want to keep your garage door opener on your sun visor because someone breaks the glass to your car, they've got access to your house by using garage door. So locking mechanisms on your vehicle as far as uh, security goes, you know, um, does it have an alarm? Does the car have an alarm? Do you have tinted windows? Something where maybe if someone was trying to watch you to see what you have in that vehicle, would the tent kind of deter them? Or if someone was about to come up and carjack you, with the chance of maybe because your windows are tinted and they can't tell if you're looking at them as they're approaching your vehicle, would that deter them? So just little things about security. Um, seating capacity, and this is really just dependent upon you and your family, you know, if you have a large family, is there enough seats for everybody sort of deal? Uh, not a huge thing, but it would be a deal breaker if you have a family of five and you're trying to drive a, a pickup truck with just a bench seat row in the front, you know? And then the last one is what we've already discussed is impression. Is it low profile? Would it draw attention? And it's not the end of the world. Even myself, I drive a bright red Jeep. So that's my bug out vehicle because there's this different rules of schools of thought on the whole thing. Um, and for me, you know, I'm thinking like if the world does end, if someone sees this red Jeep, does that just automatically mean this is the guy we got to hit? I kind of think that they're going to look at it and be like, dude, this guy's decked out. He's probably armed. Let's not mess with him sort of thing. So it's not the end of the world to have like this car that kind of stands out, but it's definitely something you need to keep in the fourth thought. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Because I mean, if we're talking about a, a real crap has hit the fence scenario where the streets you know, are very dangerous where you may come to a point where there's a checkpoint, checkpoint by people, you know, marauders or yeah. people like that. 
you know, you do want to get through them. You want to be able to go around them if possible. And yep. if you have to go off road, then you're going to have to have a vehicle that's going to be able to do it. Yep. Yeah. So, so that's, those, those are good tips and I appreciate that. So what, what do you think that people may act like when, when an actual crap is hit the fence scenario may actually come around? I, I kind of think we're seeing it a little bit right now. Don't you? Yeah, I do agree. It's, you're talking about um, the, the riots and everything that we're seeing in all, all the major cities, right? Yep. You're, you're looking at people looking for any reason to get out and show their true character and you know, last night we had 911, uh, the computer system or all, whatever controls the 911 system go down where in multiple states you hit 911, nothing would happen. Uh, I believe they said there was over a thousand 911 calls placed with no answer. Um, so things can go bad real quick. You know, a grid, the grid can go down. We can either be hacked, the EMP can hit. Um, the grid itself is so fragile. Um, and people are already showing who they really are. They're, they're rioting, they're looting, they're burning down buildings. They're, they're, they're doing all this sort of stuff. Um, so it's going to look like that because right now these people that the people that don't want to be involved in it, are just trying to go to work or school or wherever it is. They're at risk of their life. Um, you know, hospitals are being blocked. Roads are being blocked. Ambulances can't get places. So you're already losing some of the, the basic services that, your taxes and government provides um, and people are already leaving. You've got the people out and out West uh, bugging out from these wildfires, like sometimes in a matter of seconds having, having to get out of there. Um, and imagine if all this hap continues to happen and there's no reverting back, there's no like in game or end point and it just keeps getting worse. And then you add something like power being out um, on top of it all, people will lose their minds and they'll start going door to door and looting turns into marauding very quickly. Um, so if you're in the areas that are susceptible to it because of dense population um, or something like that, you're going to want to get out quick. Yeah. And I, and I agree with you uh, they, they are showing their, their true colors. The thing about it is that there's people getting paid. Those, those are the ones that you don't really pay attention to because they, they are being paid to do it. But the people who are volunteering to be out there and do it, do it because they want to do it. They, you know, they want to, uh, I guess you can say purge, you know, as we saw in the movies, how the whole yeah. idea was they, they, they're doing those things and they're doing it for fun. You know, not really, not necessarily because they, they have, uh, they want change or anything like that. But we have yeah. seen that there, some of them are, are looting because they see the opportunity of doing it. Others are going and, um, you know, showing their true colors because they finally can do it without any repercussion. And the people who do yeah. get arrested, it has turned out that they actually, um, they get released. They don't get charged or anything like that. So and they're back out there oh, doing it again. What's that? I said it, they get released and they're back out doing it again. And doing it right yeah. again, you know, and, and those might be the people who don't get paid. So yeah. we are seeing all of that. And, and to your point, uh, also what, something that I've seen now that I think about it is that now, uh, people from the rural areas are starting to go out and they're starting to meet these protesters, these rioters, all these people who are, you know, creating chaos and now they're facing face to face, you know, and to me, it's just a matter of time before everyone brings their guns and then they start shooting at each other. What do you think? I mean, anything can happen. I, I think we're a, a, a bit away from that happening on any sort of large scale, but yeah, you, you could see small little fragments, you know, pop up in the news, just like the Kyle Rittenhouse thing or whatever. Right. Um, but I, I'm hoping things in the coming months start back in, and going back to normal a little bit, but this was kind of a glimpse into the future at how easy um, things can collapse. And especially if you add other aggravating factors such as a pandemic or like I said, a, a grid failure or other things added to it. So do you think that things may get better or worse after the election? Um, I think we'll stop hearing about the, the coronavirus. I think the political use of exaggerating that will be dying, will die down. Um, but it's hard to say what will happen as far as the political or the, the climate, as far as the riots and everything goes. It's hard to say. Right. All right. So, so 
as you mentioned a minute ago, you know, people are having to bug out all of a sudden. What do you think or what, what do you recommend for people's plan to look like for them to be ready to bug out at a moment's notice as people in California and other places have actually, you know, seen themselves in? Yeah. Um, so bugging out is, is the worst case scenario. It's the last thing you should want to do because home, home is where the heart is, right? But home is where everything you have is. It's where all your preps are. It's where you are the most prepared. You're in the most known vi- environment. You, you know where the doors are. You know which way the doors open. Um, you have food in the cabinet. When you leave home, anything can happen. There is no predictability. So bugging out should always be not, not the first thing you think about. It should be the, the last thing that's going to have to happen. Um, you bug out when it is no longer safe to be at home and it's far safer to not be at home, such as when a wildfire is coming, you will burn and die if you don't leave your house. Um, just because things are erupting around you or things are getting bad or the power went out, the power's been out for a month. That's not a reason to bug out. You, you bug out when the power's been out for a month and looters or whatever uh, people came through your neighborhood two or three nights in a row and your neighbor's house got broke into the next night, your other neighbor's house got broke into and there's no sign of relief and it, it keeps happening. And you're like, dude, this could happen at my house. Someone could break in tomorrow. Um, you know, the, the police have been defunded or disbanded or whatever it is. No one's coming. Um, I think I need to get out of here. So you, while I say that's the last thing you should do, it's the first thing you should prepare for. So you should have a bug out, ve- uh, a bug out bag. You should have an inch bag. Um, you should have a bug out vehicle, which is what we start talking about to begin with, because that bug out vehicle is your way to egress. You don't want to be, you know, huffing it on foot through the backwoods with some bug out bag on your back. Um, your vehicle is your first choice and you don't want to wait till something's happening and you're like, all right, honey, I think it's time to bug out. Let's start packing the truck up. That should already have a base layer of items in it. Um, so if you had to bug out in 30 seconds, you could. Um, so have a bag packed, have your vehicle prepped at all times. And if it is one of those bug out, like I don't think I'm gonna be able to come back home, at least not for a few months, um, we use what's called an inch. I'm never coming home. Um, and that's just kind of an upgraded version of a bug out bag um, where you're having things that will help you sustain for a little bit longer, such as solar panels to, to recharge your phones or to run a small fridge or something like that, depending on, if, you know, do you have insulin that your family has to have or just the, the comfort ability of it. Um, the inch will provide you with more resources and sustainability for a longer period of time. Yeah, those, are, those are sound, sound great. So I guess uh, one of the things that I did wanted to ask, um, should people defend their property and till the last moment where they no, can no longer uh, protect it or they should just go ahead and get out of Dodge without, you know, trying to get out of confrontation as much as possible. I'm a believer in avoid confrontation. Um, like I say, if, if you've already determined it's no longer safe to be home, then don't be home. But if it's like you're at the border of like, you know, nothing's happened yet at my house. You know, I'm hearing about the neighbors next door. I'm hearing about um, the next town over, you know, things happening. Um, you, you need to be ready, even though you haven't made that final decision to bug out. But what if before you make the decision, yes, yeah, something happens and someone comes on your property. Yeah, strong believer of defending yourself and your property. Um, you, you don't, you, you come into my house, you you're probably not going to leave. Um, if, if they're willing to, to destroy, to put their own life on the line to destroy your property, then they're valuing your property over their own life. So you might as well give them what they're wanting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You, uh, yeah. I'm not a believer of rolling over and just taking it. Yeah. You know, I do believe in, in protecting uh, your family, your property, things that you have worked all your life for, especially when you're a prepper, you know that eventually you're going to have to give it up, but not at just at the first person that comes by and tries to take him from you. So for the people who, who, you know, may find themselves, let's say in an apartment building or they don't have a second home or anything like that. They don't really have a place to bug out to. What would you recommend they go? 
Um, so it's part of a planning process you'll make beforehand. And we actually have a guide called ICERS in case of emergency response plan. So it's, it's a plan you put together with your friends, your family, your inner circle, um, where it'll, it'll lay out different um, categories and the categories each have an action plan. And basically what that does is if you do have to bug out, it's, it's outlining where you're gonna go. So other members in your family or inner circle know where you're going if you have to bug out. So if you're one of those people, pardon me, <coughs> coronavirus. <laughs> if you're one of those people that have to bug out and you don't have a, another home or somewhere, because really who does, you know? I mean, I have a little cabin in the woods, but no one actually has, for the most part, has an actual Second castle or fort somewhere. So that's when you coordinate with other people. Like if, say I'm on the eastern side of North Carolina and I've got friends on the northern side of the North Carolina, uh, we coordinate with each other like, hey, if uh, you know some earthquake happens out there or if a flood or whatever it may be, if that happens out west, then you come to my house out, out here on the east or vice versa. You know, if riding's happening over here out east, I'm going to come to your house. So friends and family are your first bug out locations. Um, and you may want to have rally points along the way. Um, for example, you know, me and my family, we have a specific place. Um, I won't name what it is, but to give you an idea, let's say there's this museum that you grew up going to as a child and the museum is, you know, it doesn't get much traffic. It's got this big parking lot and a wooden line behind it. And it's halfway between my house and my relative's house. Um, I make that as a rally point and I have like a survival cache there dug in the ground back in the wood line as kind of a resupply points because you never know, you may not be able to drive to your bug out location. You may have to walk. So having a set area where you do have some resupply, you do have a water purifier, some ammo, you know, whatever it is already stashed away. Um, so what I'll recommend people bug out, I recommend they bug out to a friend, a family member, specific locations that can be navigated to without GPS um, based on like either strip maps or, you know, using uh, what do you call them landmarks to be able to help you navigate to it. Yeah. Yeah. That, that sounds, that sounds like a great idea. And, and yeah, uh, having, having the caches are, are something that people really need to look into, you know, and, and put it in a place where nobody else is going to find it, uh, you know, accidentally or anything like that. And having a rally point is really important. So that, that's, that's great advice and I appreciate it. So uh, as far for communications, what, what do you recommend people do? Um, so I guess you've got your, your primary means of communication. That's your cell phone, right? We, we, as soon as anything happens, we have our cell phone. We call 911 or we call mom and dad and tell them what happened or, hey, can you pick me up? Um, so your, your cell phone is always your first choice is your primary, uh, communications. Your, your, al your alternative communication can also still be your cell phone. It's like emails, it's text. Um, it, it could, it could be landline phones. Um, so you start with what you're used to, what's right there on you, your cell phone, then you move to your, your landlines and Wi-Fi based like apps and stuff for emailing and texting. Um, Cellular service may be down, maybe Wi-Fi is still working. You can use Wi-Fi to be able to send a message through some, you know, Facebook Messenger or something. And then you start moving into like contingency communications. And these are things like your satellite phone, um, your GMRS or FRS radios. FRS is what people call walkie-talkies. Um, you use that sort of communication, even CB radio. And I guess like your, your worst case would be something like a, a ham radio. Um, so you just, you kind of, you want to use what you have first and see if it's going to work. So we're always going to try our cell phone first. Um, but communication isn't always electronic. You know, it, it can be things like uh, message drops. You know, like I said, we have rally points. I uh, discussed how you can have various rally points. Those rally points can be message drop locations um, where you, when you do have to go to it to resupply, leave a note in case someone else is also bugging out to the same family member's house and they're stopping there. They can see that, Oh, you know, John and Mary have already stopped by here and they said that they're moving to Tom's house or whatever. So you can use physical forms of written communication. Um, even if you, you think family members travel along the same highway, 
you know, in an end of the world certain scenario, you can use code on like a billboard to give a signal like, you know, rally point five or something. And the, it, it, I'll use a lot of these terms, but if you, if you get our ICER's guide, it all makes sense um, because it, the ICER's guide talks about, you know, internal communication codes and rally points and bug out locations. And it makes it easy to, to be able to communicate outside of the electronic field. All right. Yeah, that, that's, that's great advice. And uh, can you give us that website one more time where people can find these guides? Yeah, it's superessystraps.com and that's S-U-P-E-R-E-S-S-E straps.com. All right. That, that's great. That's awesome. All right. So, so what, what do you think that um, people should be preparing for? You know, what, to you, what's the, the most likely scenario that will create a real crap has hit the fan scenario where either the government is extremely busy, you know, fighting a war somewhere or, you know, fending off an invasion or something like that. But what, what do you see happening, you know, in the next 10 or 20 years? <laughs> I don't know. I guess if I did, I'd be the richest man in the world. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I guess me personally, I prepare for the sort of grid down scenario, which could could follow before or after other events that are already happening, such as, as you see now, civil unrest. So it's like grid down scenario plus some other aggregating factor. Um, but I think if, if you plan for a grid down scenario, it's kind of like you've heard the saying, like if you prepare for a zombie apocalypse, you're ready for anything. That's how I, I take it. If you're preparing for like a grid down scenario, you you've thought about what will happen after power's out for so long and how people will act. So you've thought about the defending yourself aspect. You've thought about the, the powering, you know, having lights and um, communication alternatives. Um, so for me, I, I prepare for grid down, whether it's EMP based, which we've seen some uptick with China talking about things like that and their capabilities with a hemp. But I would think it would be more of a cyber sort of attack on our, on our grid that would take that down. Um, but right now I'm just preparing for human beings being awful, which they continue to show how awful they are and how bad things can get. Um, so yeah. 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 That, that's great because the, the EMP commission, you know, from Congress, uh, they did, they did bring out a report saying that China, if for, for them an EMP is not a nuclear device for them, it's just a conventional, uh, warfare strategy. So they would take out our grid if if they uh, really wanted to, or that you know that would be one of their first steps. And that in the report it said that about ninety percent of the U.S. would perish because you know there would be no more supply chain. The the the, the trucks would stop running. People would be freaking out because they can't resupply. You, you know the power would be out. There would be no water coming through the faucet. So all the all of those are, are real tangible things that we can see here in the near future, especially since the, the uptick and, you know, the, the, the possibility of war with China and Russia and other, and other players seems to be more likely. What, what are your thoughts on, on, on the possibility of World War III? Uh, it's not something I've personally seen a lot of uh, calls for concern for uh, as far as a world, multiple um, countries and nationalities being involved in a war. Uh, I mean, anything could happen at any time. You, you saw how kind of sensitive things were with North Korea for a little bit there before it kind of died off. But I, I don't have a lot of concern right now for World War III, um, at least not in the coming years. Um, I'm, I'm still more worried about the grid down thing. And like you said, supply, you know, one, one day, one delay in a truck delivering to a certain city causes three weeks uh, before you can actually start resupplying because as soon as there's that little bit of delay and, and one thing's out, like we saw with toilet paper during the pandemic, mm -hmm. people buy up all the rest of the toilet paper. Then they're like, well, we better get a bunch of canned foods and it just trickles down. So if you have a week delay of like food of trucks, not delivering, you're talking about three months before you start getting things restored. And if there isn't, you know, after a month of supply, not running to your city or whatever, you know, it's like that's that's where that percentage came from, about 90% perishing, because then all of a sudden no one can get food from anywhere um, and it gets bad quick. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So going back to the subject of uh, bug out vehicles, um, for, for the prepper that does have a little bit of money, you know, laying around, they can spend 
yeah. a couple thousand dollars without really worrying about it. What would you recommend they buy as far as a vehicle and had to make it ready, you know, for yeah. bug out and, and all those scenarios? Yeah. So we talked about how the vehicle, whatever vehicle you, you get is really up to use. Use those eight things, you know, speed, um, storage, um, the impression it makes, mobility, mileage. Use all those to determine your vehicle. So I'll leave that up to the individual person because it most likely it's going to be the vehicle they already have unless you're rich or something. Right. So you always want to have, you always want to think about first aid. So have first aid in it, tourniquets, have a tourniquet for every member in your family and an extra one. Your basic first aid supplies, um, health and hygiene. You want to have extra water bottles. Um, you want to have water pur purification tablets or a filter because um, you never know when, you know, a, a gallon of water, if you're traveling for a day or two on the road, that's gone. Yeah. I mean, that's gone. So have alternative means for that. Um, your kind of self, self rescue or self uh, egress. Like if you have a flat tire, um, or if you have a vehicle rollover, have things like a seatbelt cutter, a glass breaker, a flare gun, um, fire suppressors, you know, my vehicle has a fire extinguisher in it. Um, things that keep your vehicle moving. Um, so this is like a fix a flat. This is a spare tire. This is a jumper cable. This is, uh, or those little jump boxes, which those jump boxes are actually pretty amazing. I got one on Amazon for like 50 bucks and it works and it's got a USB charger on it. So it's kind of a multi-use, um, a portable air compressor would be nice. I don't personally have one. Um, but I guess if things got worse, it might be something I would look into. Um, you, the maintenance of your vehicle itself, you know, have things to be able to scrape ice off, you know, depending on where you live, um, make sure you have a toolkit to be able to change the tire, to be able to, you know, adjust a screw or something that's coming loose. Um, and again, back to where, you, where you're from, you know, maybe you need a snow, a snow shovel, sorry, <laughs> tongue twister there, um, <laughs> chains for your tire, uh, maybe a chainsaw if you live around trees and a tree's falling down, blocking your only escape, your only road from your house. Um, if not a chainsaw, you know, just a saw or something, you can move something that's falling in your way, an ax, um, PPE, you know, your personal protective equipment, gloves, nitrile, nitrile gloves, so you don't have to worry about the, um, the allergy component of that, um, mask and stuff like that, glasses if you're working on your vehicle. Um, again, communications. So my, my vehicle right now has a satellite phone in it um, and GMRS radio. Those are my two built-in kind of comms devices. And of course, I have a backup cell phone in my vehicle um, that's wrapped in a Faraday bag. Um, another option is get, get one of those pay-as-you-go phones. Just would like, I don't know how to even do it these days if they're phone cards or whatever, but just an unactivated pay-as-you-go phone. So if you need to, you can activate it real quick and um, have some minutes on your phone um, and keep that in a Faraday bag as well and keep emergency contacts in there with it because most people don't remember people's phone numbers now. So make sure you have that in case something happened to your cell phone, which I imagine it did if you're using your backup, you know, cell phone. Yeah. Um, you want basic things. You want flashlights. Uh, you want napkins, paper towels, um, a spare key somewhere hidden on your vehicle. Um, whether it be zip tied up underneath the vehicle or under a, a flat piece of duct tape on the roof. Uh, you never know when you get locked out and last thing you want to do is break your window and now you're driving around with a broken window. Um, basic supplies, always have a roadmap for where you live, where your state is and where you're going. So if you have a bug out location three states over, not only do you need to have a continental United States map, have specific state maps for the states you have to travel through. Um, on your phone, your phone is your greatest source for everything. Um, even if there's no Wi-Fi, no data, your phone can have downloaded maps on it. You can have thousands of PDFs and uh, reference information on your phone. It's got a flashlight on it. Um, the phone's a great tool, even without any sort of internet. Um, have I named enough to help give people some tips for prepping their vehicle, you think? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you want to continue, you know, go ahead. But if you think that's enough, then then yeah, that's fine. We can move on. That that's kind of the gist of it. Um, and again, we we did write an entire bug out vehicle uh, guide and checklist. Just go down the checklist, check boxes. We make it simple for people. Whether you've never uh, made a bug out vehicle, 
bug out bag before or anything it, it's simple stuff and a lot of the stuff you're going to realize you have at home and you don't have to go out and buy so go through the list and then the next the next thing i will say or touch on is it's not just about having it in your vehicle it's about knowing where it is in your vehicle you don't want to have some emergency that happens at night and you're like, uh, I'm not sure where my flashlight is, but I think it's in the trunk. I think it's in this bag, in this zipper wrapped in this uh, compartment. Like, you don't want to be doing all that. Think about the order of when you may need things. Your glass breaker should be, if not on your person, should be somewhere secured to the vehicle. So if you're in a rollover, when your mind's already trying to figure out which way's up, you don't want to be looking around for that glass breaker that was sitting over here in the cup holder and it's since flown throughout the car. Um, <laughs> Think about where you're securing things that like I have a seatbelt cutter on my bracelet for just that, that purpose. Um, think about, you know, you want to have a flashlight right here to grab. You want your gun to be right here to grab your, you want your tourniquet to be right here to grab. You don't need your band aid right there to grab. You don't need your poncho right there to grab. So think about where things should, would be in, in the urgency of which you'll need them and always put them back in the same spot. So in your mind, it starts getting built in. My flashlight is always here. My gun is always here. You know, my whatever is always over there in that compartment. So tactically place your equipment that you're loading your vehicle with, place it in the right location. Yeah, yeah, all those are great tips and I appreciate it. So for, for someone, let's say that we, you know, let's create this scenario where someone would have to bug out by foot, you know, let, let's just say that with, with 50 million people unemployed right now, the last thing that they can do um, is take their car because he got repossessed, right? Yeah. Let's, let's put that scenario there. And let's say they had to bug out by foot. How, how long do you recommend or what time frame do you recommend that they get to their bug out location? I guess but let's put aside every other kind of scenario as far as reading into it too much. Just kind of what we have there. Um, in general, uh, a three-day walk it would be the max you'd want a bug out location. Um, otherwise, you, you need to have rally points set up a day apart, each rally point with a, a cash or a family member or a friend's house somewhere. So if you have a family member, if you're closest, let's say you're in a state and you just moved there, you have no friends, right? Um, your, your family's back, say, back east and you're out west. Um, if that's going to be tough. I mean, every decision you make is going to affect how you will survive if you have to bug out. So that decision to move away from friends and away from family has kind of put you in a tough, a tough little pickle there where you really don't have anywhere to go. I mean, traveling multiple States, that's going to take, you know, 40 days to go to your bug out location. Um, I don't have advice for that. That's, that's a, a choice you made, whether it be, you know, professional for your job, you had to go there or whatever. Um, but start making a connection as soon as you get there and try to come up with other people that maybe you could bring into your inner circle and make part of your, your plan. But otherwise just don't try to bug out for more than three days without a vehicle or even with a vehicle. Um, Cause there's just, there, you know, like I said, I've, I've hiked the Appalachian trail and it's, it's a whole thing to be able to plan food and how you're going to eat and drink water for three weeks at a time without stopping anywhere for supplies. It's, it's not something you can just do. Right. Yeah. No. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. It's something that has to be planned. You know, that's the whole purpose of, of creating a bug out plan. Uh, one of the things that I have been faced with and that I've been considering is what, what would happen to people, let's say who are at work, on a Tuesday and an EMP hits, right? Um, and then you, the car no longer works, their cell phone is not working. Yeah. And, and let's say the, the husband works downtown, which is, you know, let's say 40 miles away. The wife works east 20 miles away and all the kids are in school. So um, what would you recommend for them to have a rally point, meet up or just get home as fast as you can and get the kids? Um, what do you think that the more realistic thing people could do about something like that yeah that's a good one so let's say like you say your the wife works over here husband works over here and you have two kids in two different schools okay maybe for this scenario um so this is where the planning comes into play this is where icers comes into play because all of it's on there um so on my icers guide i would have it set up if that happens first of all everyone has to have a get home bag ghb 
get home bag is different than a bug out bag. It's not this big heavy bag you throw on. A get home bag is supposed to last you a max of 24 hours. Um, and it's just got, it's got the bare essentials in it, which could be like a portable radio, or maybe you could talk to your wife and, and coordinate. Um, but the ICER's guide is designed to um, get, make you, the ICER's guide is designed to allow you to survive when you can't communicate with others. So if you could communicate with others, you don't have to have some predetermined plan, right? You can just on the phone right there, like here, here's where we're going. Or, hey, honey, you pick up him, I'll meet you at home. So ICER's guide is designed to have it pre-designed where if you can't contact each other, this is what you're going to do. So in that scenario, the dad, the EMP just hit, the, the work is going to decide after probably 20 minutes, like, look, this isn't just a power outage. Um, you guys are free to go home for the day, um, you know, be safe. So dad grabs his GHB. He goes to the high school to pick up, you know, John. Um, that's a, a six mile walk for him to the high school. And then maybe he's got a 20 mile walk home, maybe less, what I forgot what you said. And then the wife's doing the same thing. The wife's going to the middle school to pick up uh, Mary and, Wife grabs her GHB, goes to the middle school, picks up Mary. So now John's picked up, Mary's picked up, and they've each got, you know, a couple hours walk to get home. Everybody meets at home. You run across situations as you're coming home, uh, avoid, avoid population. If, it, if people are already starting to get out of control because maybe their word came out that we were attacked and now people are using this, this moment of weakness to, to mug you or to steal what you have, um, avoid, avoid people, you know. You may have to start walking no longer on the road, but start walking through through the woods. So in your get home bag, you're going to want to have a, a local map with different routes to get home, strip maps to get home from the school, strip maps to get home from uh, from work, have some form of security, you know, a gun is what I always say. Um, so EMP hits, get home, get your family members, get home, regroup, uh, pull out your icers and decide what, what you're supposed to do next or whatever guy, whatever plan you have. I'm just calling it icers because that, that's what we use. Um, but refer to your pre-made plans. But the first tip is get home. It, that's not the time to bug out. It's not like you, your wife knows, all right, let's bug out to, you know, wherever. Get home. Mm-hmm. Things aren't going to end right then just because the EMP hit. Home's still safe in almost every scenario. Right. Unless home is some apartment in the very center of Manhattan and they've already gone crazy there or something. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. And if it, if the EMP just hit, then and you're in middle of Manhattan or, or a major city, now you have to worry about a nook coming through. So I guess, <laughs> you know, you have other things to worry about. But yeah, that's why it's always best to not be in a very populated area, if at all possible. Yeah. So now that we're talking about an EMP scenario, right? Um we know that there would be, as we, as we mentioned earlier, there would be no grocery stores running, no, no hospitals uh, working, nothing like that. Now, let's say we are in an EMP, we're three months into it, right? Where the government was not able to establish power yet because, you know, everything got fried and people started bothering. What do you think would be the best items for people to stack up on in, in a future where bothering would be the main, you know, economic trade? Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. And maybe even like, like you're saying, are you kind of saying that maybe money is kind of no longer a thing just because of the situation? Right. I mean, people have all their money in the bank and now they can access it, you know? Gotcha. Um, so uh, depending on who you're dealing with, ammo in itself can be a great bartering item. Um, everyone's going to want it. They're thinking, Hey, things are bad right now. Um, ammo is what I want. Um, other things like cigarettes, alcohol, um, those are great things to barter with because they're things you don't actually need to survive with, right? So it's something you could let go of pretty easily in exchange for something else. Um, even if it's like, hey, I'm going to give you this pack of cigarettes for your car battery. And people's like, okay, yeah, sure. My car doesn't work right now. So um, yeah, let's do that deal. So now you've got a battery to add to your solar bank. So think about things you can trade for that um, you can get rid of something that's not actually necessary for survival, but other people may won't, you know, whether it be a portable DVD player, like some people are like, Oh, it's the end of the world. Um, but you know, I'm not worried about surviving right now. Yeah. I'll take that portable DVD player. And so I can watch some DVDs and, and stuff in the house. Um, so trade things that aren't necessary for survival, um, to get things that are, um, so like I said, alcohol, cigarettes, 
cash, even even toilet paper could be a great trading item. Especially it's something that we've seen in this pandemic, right? That toilet paper is gold. <laughs> it really is. And speaking of gold, uh, how do you feel about gold and silver in that scenario? I don't know. I, I, I don't know if I'm, I, I hear a lot, you know, people's like save gold, but I, I don't think the general public is educated enough on gold to know how much is it value, how, how valuable is it now? Maybe if you're going to be bartering with like some, uh, not a pawn shop, but someone that's actually like set up his own general store to exchange for gold and maybe he's determined the value of it. And so he sets his own value of it. But just like, I mean, could you tell me how much four ounces of gold is right now? Like, I mean, it's just, it's something the public is educated enough on. So Joe can walk next door and say, Hey, I'm going to give you this gold ring for, you know, those, uh, 10 bags of rice. I don't, even though we always talk about it, I don't necessarily see it as being a, uh, a monetary useful. exchange. Yeah. Useful. Mm, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cause a lot of people do, do tend to think about <laughs> gold and silver. Uh, people tend to think about gold and silver in those scenarios where, you know, they, they, they're wondering how is it going to be traded when, if they were cut off guard, especially the, the regular people who don't prep, you know, how they're going to be trading their gold and silver for what they do need. Because my, my take on it is that people in, the, in that type of scenario, people who are well off in their preps, you know, they have plenty of food and everything. They're the ones that are going to take the gold because they're not going to trade gold for their last um, bag of rice or anything like that. Uh, then, you know, they're not going to make themselves starve over a little bit of gold. So the, the thing that I've always noticed in, in other places, for example, in Venezuela, what happened is that when, when it really got really, really bad, where there were shortages, hyperinflation and everything like that, the preppers who were actually able to leave and they have gold with them, what they did is that they traded their gold in whatever country they were able to flee to and then they exchanged their currency there. So that, that is something that people have actually used gold and stuck it in the past for. Um, I don't see it. I don't see it trading privately, but if the government was to able to reestablish, you know, um, the economy, the power back, you know, law and order and everything like that, uh, gold and silver might be something that they might trade, you know, with their citizens now in exchange for the new currency. And who knows, um, let's say yeah. that it was to happen today and, you know, it would take them about five, 10 years to get it back, back running. In that, in that case, it might, we might go into a cryptocurrency or something like that. So how do you feel about cryptocurrencies and, and things like that? Should people use, uh, store those for the future since, you know, they can be saved in, a, in a, one of those little drive sticks or, or what do you think about that? I mean, we're, we've already talked so much how fragile everything electronic is. I wouldn't want to put all my stock into cryptocurrency again, it's kind of like the, the gold thing. I agree with you. Gold, I don't think gold will ever be a private to private party sort of survival uh, money. But I, I do see it, like you said, if you have to escape the country or if the country is being rebuilt and now it needs a form of money, gold would be the first choice. You know, maybe if there was a hiccup and now things are back to normal, maybe cryptocurrency could come in handy. But I don't, I don't know enough about it to speak on to it, onto that topic. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just something that I've seen in, you know, in, in purple circles that they're talking about uh, getting crypto because uh, since it's not regulated by governments yet, you know, you can take it across border without having to register or yeah. letting them even know that you have it. So, you know, people are seeing that as an, as an advantage to actually uh, take it back and forth or trading or doing whatever. But of course we're assuming that if an EMP just hit, then we're a total war and, you know, God knows how long that will last. So, so yeah, so um, anything that you would like to, to share or, or, you know, scenarios that people should prepare for or anything like that? No, man, uh, Jose, I definitely appreciate you letting me on the program. Um, I will say, guys, everything, everything's about planning and preparing. Um, it's not about, you know, the whole list of stuff you have in your car to make you the most prepared. It, it's about the planning and the mindset. And like you said, that was a great scenario about what would happen if the EMP hit and, you know, he's at work, you're at work, um, planning solves that problem. It lets you know why well, I'm going to that high school to pick John up and I'm going there. Uh, planning what is what it's all about. So get some sort of uh, 
resource and put some put some work and time and effort into planning in case something does happen. Um, but again, I appreciate you having me on the show, brother. Yeah, yeah, and I appreciate you for coming. I hope uh, hopefully we can talk again in the future. I really yeah. enjoy this talk, and and I know the the Men Men Survival audience will also enjoy this as well because it was put it was packed of information and. You know, all of this is is very valuable, and we appreciate you for your time. Yes, sir, man. I appreciate it. All right, and again, uh, your website. Can you give it give it to us one more time, please? Yeah, guys. If you're interested in that Isher's guide I've talked about, that that prepping planner planning template um, or a bug out vehicle checklist, you can go to superessestraps.com. It's super like Superman, so S U P E R E S S E straps S T R A P S dot com. All right. Well, again, thank you so much for coming to the show. Have a good one. Take care, brother. All right. And thank you, everybody, for for joining us today. This was Wesley with us today. And again, I want to remind you that my name is Jose Prado. Always ready. The Man-Made Survival Show.